it was a real movie of craft, and Jim crafted it beautifully. So. Uh, what, what they said? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, I think I think uh, honestly what they said, but also one thing that uh, I, I didn't hear was uh, the diversity <laughs> of, of the cast, uh, and this was you know a long time ago, and they had. I mean, I think everybody that went to the movie, they saw uh, Americans up there. They saw uh, they saw relationships, and and it, it was like the United Nations. And even even I mean, who knows if, if Vasquez is, is, is gay or straight or what? Dude? You know, but it was just like it had it had everything in that movie, and so I think the, the casting of it was was part of it. Really. The Jewish spot player. <laughs> <laughs> and we must give a great big welcome to newcomer to Days of the Dead, Carrie's brother. Please, everyone. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think it was just kind of a fluke thing that uh, we had no 
Thank you. I mean, I don't think we had any clue we were getting into it. So we had no idea. I mean, you know, 37, like I said, 37 years later, it's, it's, it's uh, light bulb. You're going to be sitting here on stage with your sister going, whoa. <laughs> well, I remember going to a screening. I was pregnant with my daughter, and I, Jeanette was there. And she's like, have you gone to conventions? I was like, what's that? And she's like, wait, you haven't gone to any? And I said, no, I don't even know what that is. She's like, Carrie, you, you've got to go to some of these things. That's pretty cool. And then shortly after that, I was invited to my first one. So, I mean, I had no real clue even how big Aliens was because I don't live in L.A. I don't really... I have my own life. This is like my secret hidden life that you know I mean, people know about, but it's not something that comes. It doesn't define me. Um, it's part of me, but you know. Do we have any audience questions? Yes, first you and then you. Um, I love Zena most. Zena most girl. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, how was you got the story as far as the How was it like working with Sigourney? How was it both? Or just Sigourney? Yeah. How was it working with, um, like, reaching out to actors who have good stories to share? Oh. And the joy to give them to us. Well, I worked very closely with Azina Morris because <laughs> he, he grabbed me and took me straight up in the air. <laughs> Talk about old school. <laughs> this is about the most, ba not even a harness. This is the old, most basic stunt I've ever heard of in my life. It was a giant seesaw. A gigantic seesaw with one end about six feet off the ground. And my blocking instructions were to land, and mind you, I'm carrying a live flamethrower. Rico knows all about it intimately. And I had to land on the bottom of the seesaw. Immediately after the stunt man lands behind me and grabs me, and at that time, crew members start pulling down on the high end of the seesaw very quickly. So we're on one level, and the and the angle changes immediately. At that time, I'm being grabbed. My angle is changing, and I have to lower my flamethrower, live flamethrower, and fire it. <laughs> And about the first three or four times I fell off. And I was terrified because like tick tick, time is really money on this set because it, they ran a tight, tight budget and I was really frightened and I had to make it work. And people say, were you frightened when, the, when you were grabbed by the alien? And I say, the stunt man is like cracking jokes in my ear. No, I was not frightened of him. I was frightened of the camera. I wanted to do the second half of the stunt, which was the going up, that's when we, you would get the harness and you go straight up in the air. I really wanted to do that. And they, they didn't have the insur insur insurance for it, so it was a stunt woman. Much smaller than I am, actually, but they only shoot her from underneath, and then I went in and did the screen. <laughs> so, like, a lot of people always think, like, the Xenomorph maybe scared me a little bit when you're in the water. Um, but what people don't know is, like, um, so the first assistant director was worried that the water would get too cold for me. So he, they actually paid someone to stay overnight to make sure it stayed warm. But the problem he had is it was actually too warm. And so I was really excited about doing that scene, but not for all the obvious. You know how like they give you like those uh, like foil blankets? I was super excited to get a foil blanket afterwards. Um, so the, the alien and I were in there, but it would get so hot and I would get really flushed. So on the side, there were bars. So often you would, and there's a picture of me somewhere, and the alien and I are sitting next to each other. He's got his head off, and we're both drinking a cup of tea, like kicking our feet and doing all that kind of fun stuff. So like that stuff would happen, and then you got to get in there and be scared of them, but it's like your friend who you were just like, you know, I mean, I think at one point we were like holding onto the side and pretending like we were swimming and that. Um, so it, it, it sometimes was kind of difficult, even like with the queen, you know, 10 minutes before we took the shot, your friends are like hanging out of the, and it's like how, it's hard to be scared of something when you know kind of what's going on. I think you're the only person who was born on that set, by the way. It was freezing <laughs> cold, and they had to keep coming, putting this gel on our face to make it look, make us look like we're sweating. I'm glad I was born. 
Well, the scene with the when we first deploy on the planet, where it's pouring with rain, and talking about the the um, space blankets, the silver blankets, um, it was really hideously cold, and I, I we had we did take after take, and you have to you know the words were like Q rain, and it starts pouring on you, and then Q wind, and these giant fans start. <laughs> And you have to run and do your business and stuff. And then in between takes, we were like, and they came and they wrapped us in those space blankets, and I called it the day of the giant baked potatoes. I got to use that blanket twice, I like to say, because I used it in the med lab as well. with me, and he would make a paper chain with me, um, and it was just kind of like, the 
big brother, you know, and like kind of taking care of me and everything. And even as we got older, obviously it's been a long time since I had seen him, and we went to Calvert, we had a big um, reunion there. And someone said, oh, Bill Paxton's here. And so I ran over to say hi, and I went around the back, and he just kind of like looked at me and smiled and said, oh, hi, like kind of thinking, why is this person here? And everyone who was in line obviously realized who before they were taking pictures, and suddenly he like stopped what he was doing. <laughs> And he looked at me again, and he's like, wait, you're Carrie. And I said, I am. And he's like, oh my gosh, guys, this is Carrie. You're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of the first time we'd seen each other in a really long time. And then we all went out to a dinner that night, and Bill was telling me, he's like, hey, so you need to call the restaurant, Carrie, and tell them to hold it, because we want them to hold it for after our panel, because they close like, right around the time the panel is finished. And I looked at him, I said, you want me to call? And ask them to hold it? And he's like, yeah, I go, dude, dude, hi, this is Carrie Hand, can you please hold it? And I'm like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> or hi, this is Bill Paxton, can you please hold it? And he's like, okay, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he ended up calling, but like, even for me, sometimes as I was sitting there, I'm like, oh, this is my buddy Hudson. And I'm like, oh my God, this is Bill Paxton. Like, he's just amazing as an actor. Um, so I kind of had a different experience, I think, probably just <laughs> uh, working with Billy, I, the one thing I want to say, I uh, did a film with him and Michael called Wars of Discipline. We were all uh, West Point guys together. And we got to know each other. And the quality that Billy had, which is just inherent in who he is, was, it is this every man. And that he was always himself, whatever the situation is. But in theater and in movies, I think you get really successful when it becomes ensemble. Everybody's doing their job, their own job as best they can. And the film has that chemistry. And Billy was always a huge glue uh, when you worked with him because he was always just fun to be around, uh, amazing heart. And he took everybody just for who they were. Can I tell you a really cool story about Bill that he was telling me last time I saw him? Um, he was actually at JFK's last, did you tell you guys that? Yeah, he was at his last speech, yeah. And if you like Google and see a picture from JFK, there's a few pictures from JFK's point of view, and you see two boys sitting on shoulders, and it was him, him and his cousin. So he and I had some really cool information, like discussions about that, and he had a lot to do with the museum that they have. Um, he bought different things and donated it, so it was it was pretty cool. I mean, that's awesome. And and Bill was an avid modern art collector. This was his passion. His children were his real passion. But speaking of others who are amazed, like uh, Al Matthews. I mean, that talk about real deal energy for oh, yeah. for a crew of Marines. And, uh, and tremendous character, amazingly complex, bona fide, you know, Green Beret, served in Vietnam. Uh, but it was an interesting journey that Al took. You know, he does this great movie, it's a huge, huge role, and he disappears to Spain. Yeah, and then he retired and died. Then. But he was a real, real lovely guy. I, I would just like to say that we, we often don't talk about uh, Al, and I don't, sometimes I wonder if he gets the, uh, the true uh, credit for, for what he brought to the film, because, because Al, as, as uh, Mark said, was the real deal, and having the real deal around you, it changed all of us, you know, it, it showed us the level of, of what we're talking about, and I think uh, besides having us do a little boot camp before we started filming, I think having an owl on set really um, kind of gave us the the authenticity that we that we needed for that for that project. It wasn't only Al, we also had um, a member of the Royal SAS as he was one of the stuntmen who had a non-speaking role because the two the two British stuntmen who were suited up and part of our number couldn't get the American accent right, so they're non-speaking people, but they're both wonderful people and they're both no longer with us. But Tip Tipping and, and Al, between the two of them, just kicked our butts.
service. They then. were not, they spared no quarter. They were mean. <laughs> you know, they beat us up to do it right. And it, we're so thankful for it. I would Trevor Stedman as well. Uh, Alvaro uh, did these cons, but I'm, I'm sure this is one story he might have told if he, if he did them. He was, after he got out of the army, he was um, shell-shocked. And it was difficult because sometimes, uh, it ended up growing his, his marriage because sometimes he'd wake up in the middle of the night and he'd be choking his wife. You know, crazy stuff. And he said he, he, they were going to church, and this was the final straw, and he said they were going to church. And she was dressed up really nicely, and he was dressed, and a truck backfired. And he threw her on the ground and jumped on top of her to try and save her. Because and this is the kind of guy that they brought to set for us to look at and see and hear the stories that give us that authenticity of being a, a real Marine, you know, and some of the after effects of it. So it was, uh, it was uh, we had a really good relationship. It was definitely like a, a big brother relationship on set. Because of him, I ended up uh, getting going into real estate because he told me, if I were you and I was your age, I know what I know now, I would take the money from this film, go into the best neighborhood I could find, and buy the biggest property I could find. And that was Big Brother Talk on set. <laughs> I want to direct this over to Ian. So Ian is part of the franchise, but in other segments of it, as a professional monster. And I would love to know what is what are some of the challenges of getting in prosthetics makeup and portraying all these amazing characters that are that scare us to death. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, it's uh, I feel kind of young in terms of uh, franchise history because I've been here only twenty years old this year. <laughs> um, uh, challenges around. Being a monster, um, you know, the greatest challenge is, you know, realizing that the makeup, the costume, the mask, whatever it is, isn't the right thing to me. It comes from you. You know, the play, play, play a monster is so much playing the human being. It comes from you, so you've got to connect with it. And a lot of the time, you really don't know what's, what's going to work how it's going to work until you're in it completely and it starts to make sense then you feel it from the inside. You know, and I never think of monsters as monsters, they're, they're characters. They're, they, have their own, they have their own existence, they have their own lives that they're living. And I never refer to the predator as a monster, I think it's uh, you know, it was one of the horrors. You know, so you've got to build a life for this character, you know, not just a character that uh, doesn't exist, but a character that can't possibly exist ever. <laughs> you know, you've got to make it up. So in your process, in your acting process of developing these characters, how important is costume and makeup, or do you pretty much kind of know what this character is, like you said, in its heart, before you put that up? You know, it, 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 it all starts with the costume. Starts with, I think, starts with the written word, the script, but then the designers design these uh, characters and uh, design over the years, over the last 20 years. Well, these designers have become very good friends of mine. And then you look at these characters and, you, and they build costumes and you go in to so the fit for the costume and wash them on. And you look at yourself in the mirror and then you start to, then you start to play with it and see where it is. Somewhere you don't make up, once you go, at least you try. You know, and eventually, you know, the magic will start to, will start to come. Can, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, is, I, I, this is the kind of question I would ask backstage, but since you guys are all here, you might as well hear it. <laughs> <laughs> as, as an actor, if I ever have to play uh, the villain, I make sure I find justifiable reasons why the villain is doing what he's doing. Yeah. And as a villain, I feel that my my justification is just as important as the as the hero's is for what he wants to do. Absolutely. And so I'm wondering as a monster you do you, you justify all the actions that you take. Absolutely. You know, villains don't want to be villains. Right. Villainy comes from a you know a, a much deeper psychological complex. So I've got to find that 
psychological complex. And I will go insane trying to think of how an alien thinks. So I humanize it. I try and I don't make it cute and cuddly. I, I, I try and anchor it in a human world. The predator, he's carrying weapons. The obvious thing is he's a warrior. So that's what's on the surface. So now I go deeper. Now I go back and try and figure out why he's a warrior and what kind of life he's living, the training, the sacrifice. The Pain, the suffering, all of these things, and that hurts the conflict. The, the fear of, of losing. Yeah. The fear of failure. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, it's death. <laughs> I played this uh, thing on Star Trek Discovery where I had to wear a prosthetic spare the whole thing. And uh, the one thing I wanted to do was something that I've never seen anyone do. I picked my nose, <laughs> and I went like this crazy. <laughs> I was because I've never seen anyone scratch their skin or <laughs> so I have to make a point. That's called hogging the show. You broke it. Actually, Dan, I'd like to know if you have any um, dance or movement training because one thing I noticed about the aliens is they moved in a sinuous way, you know, and it, it, that just doesn't, doesn't come out of nothing, actually. Not exactly, you know. You take what you've got and you try and build performance from what you know. I'm not going to make a character be a dancer if I don't want to dance. I'm going to use what I might not as much as. Thank you. Also, talk to our talk about somebody who's not here. Yeah. Hang on a is, is Lance Henriksen's performance and vision. believe he was an android. Total. Extraordinary. Uh, I got a few things. Like, I do agree that, like, I think I'm 44 now, but me joining the army, I think, was from, like, movies like Rambo, Aliens, and things like that. Like, there's no doubt that that was a big premise of why I joined. By the way, James Cameron co-wrote him Rambo. That's why. <laughs> I just say thank you for your service. Production office into Jim's office. There were incredible drawings surrounding the room where he took Eager's initial drawings and expanded upon them. Jim is a fabulous draftsman on his own, and it, it just knocked us sideways. I, I have to say, I had not, I was not familiar with him before. And, and I can safely say I had no clue who it was. <laughs> I 
obviously it was the only movie I've ever been in. Um, and I assumed that this was kind of the relationship that you always have on set. Like I didn't realize that it was not normal. Um, and it's, well, I'm making that normal isn't quite the right word, but. Um, but then someone was talking to me once and I said, wait, I think it was actually Sporty and I were talking. She's like, no, this isn't how it normally is on set. It's like you get close to people, but not usually everyone. And I think that could be part of why you is too. Like, we genuinely like each other, you know? Like, it's whenever I look and I see him coming to a con and there's a lot of us, I'm like, yes, all right, cool, lots of people to talk to. And I mean, um, like, Cynthia is in her Christmas party every year, you know? Uh, they'll ask, Rico always asks me about my kids. I mean, like, we genuinely care about each and every one up here, and it's, it's not fake what you see on there. Like, I mean, it's like a family reunion. I also think it's part of it um, is because of you guys. Because we've done a lot of films, all of us have done a lot of films, but you give us a reason to come back. <laughs> I <laughs> usually say, it's not guys. <laughs> but you give us the reason to come come and, and, and gather uh, a number of times a year and you know, have the opportunity. I've had, I've had the opportunity to watch Carrie's children grow up. You know, that's how long it's been. And Mark and I are like, like like two brothers who always give each other shit and talk shit about each other. You know, it is, it is really the, the family element that, that's happened uh, over these years. And it started off with the film. It started off with them giving us boot camp before we ever got in front of the camera so we could get to know each other enough so that when we are on set and we started, like there are times when you can go off script, you can start just improvising. And Jim will give you a certain amount of leverage to just go off script and do what you want to do. But if it didn't work, he'd let you know. Get back to the script. <laughs> but we knew each other enough where we could actually, at that breakfast scene, when we get out of the hyper chamber, hyper sleep chambers, and we go to breakfast, that scene with the knife and all that, uh, most of it was written, but there were, there were really choice moments that were just improv on the spot, and someone would reply. And if it worked, Jamie would keep it in, and we would keep it in. And I think it helped make that scene so real because. It was, it was us. Hey, uh, I've read stories a lot of times about uh, after the films wrap up that uh, sometimes the uh, gas gets to take like props home and things like that that were used in the film. Uh, I just wondered if any of you were lucky enough to do that and subsequently, if any of you managed to take home a pulse rifle and want to part with that, <laughs> come pick me up after the show and I'll order to my house and get you top dollar. Well, I have the saddest story of all. I was given my vest, my hat, my gloves, my bones, the bus that they made the death appliance on. And this is a life lesson. Divorce will lose you all the time. Rico has a sad story about that too. But, but, but in truth, none of us. Hey, don't tell that story because they just got married this weekend. <laughs> Nest, 
and I pulled out, they pull out like the picture I got the second grade citizenship award, the dress I'm wearing in there, I was allowed to keep. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, and I have, I think, just about every call sheet that I ever had, and I have two scripts, one that I signed then, and then one that I've signed now. So I told my children, wait till I die, and then wait a little bit, and then sell it. You have to be very lucky, uh, these days, to uh, get souvenirs or film, because everything is uh, audited as a, as a property. Um, on AVP, I asked uh, Tom McGuff Jr. if I could take a souvenir. And I said, well, I don't know, you've got lots of these uh, daggers that go around this elaborate uh, dagger that we brought on his, uh, on his shin. And uh, I said, uh, I'll you, uh, would you mind if I took a moment of souvenir? And uh, he said, um, you know, really would love to present you a moment of souvenir. Really would. But they've all been stolen. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one left. <laughs> That's what we have to finish the film with. <laughs> I got someone, I think they're called, uh, I think they're called uh, Caruso, uh, Eight Quinn was the star. And we went to Africa to shoot this film. And um, I, I played an African warrior who was being sacrificed to the gods. So basically they had, had me look like, like I'm the, the badass and then cut my head off. Yeah. And they did, they, they put the plaster and they made the, the bust of my head. And then afterwards, you know, I, they would cut, they would stop filming, and then they would drop his head and then put blood all around it. And it was, it was amazing. It was so realistic looking that after the film was over when they asked if I would like to have it. And I said, oh, hell no. <laughs> I mean, when you see yourself dead, yourself, you see yourself dead, it's, it's a creepy ass thing. <laughs> I, want, I, I want to go back one day uh, thinking of this fondest memory, um, it, I'll speak as an actor now, it's always the deepest fondness or passion an actor can have is to be proud of the work that they're doing. And to be proud of that, you have to admire all the other work that's going on around you and the uh, coherence and joy of being in a group of people doing their best, on, you know, best script, best crew, best actors, best lighting. Best is, it's like being on an Olympic team. That I'm most proud of, and in a way, as an actor, I'm fondest that we've done this together and made this work of art. Two years later, he was on a TV series, 
and then a number of years after that, he was the high lander. I don't know, Vasquez is, I guess, my favorite. <laughs> It's hard to say, but to be honest, uh, the character in Supernatural, Alistair, even of all means, from a really big influence of him. But I was, I was with him. Okay, I know you need to get to everybody, but please visit them at their tables and ask your questions. I got one more wrap up for you guys. I would love to know some. Thing that happened on a set, any set, that taught you something important? I'll start. I'll start this one. Um, I think that some of you have heard this story, but um, during the making of Aliens, we were working long hours and the budget was tight, and I think some of the crew thought they weren't getting paid the right over, overdrive or overtime fee. And I think a few people got hired from talk, got fired from talking about it. And Sigourney heard about this, and she had a conversation. And I think that she, they, they came to some type of understanding where they, moving forward, they would take them their double time for overtime, and they would hire some of the people they had fired. And it was Sigourney speaking up for the crew, the star of the show. And I'm looking at this from a young actor's point of view, and you see how the star has a certain amount of leverage and how to use it, and that it wasn't used for herself, it was used for the better, the better good of everybody. And when that crew came back to work, they put their heart and soul into their work. And I think that's one of the things that makes this, this film special, because it is a team effort. And we do our part, lighting does their part, makeup does their part, and the crew does their part. And when everybody's doing their best, as, as Bill said, I think, uh, you know, often, Good things happen. But for me, it was just watching how she managed to change the situation, not with force or anger, but just, you know, just having that conversation and doing the right thing. So that was a, a, a big lesson for me. Follow that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank There was, I mean, again, no offense to anybody, but like the girls, we were pretty awesome. And as a kid, like I kicked booty, um, and I would say Vasquez obviously was pretty awesome and Sigourney. And for me, it was kind of like, wow, you know, girls, we can kind of do whatever we want to do. Um, I, okay, I'm gonna channel my inner Spice Girls, but I feel like we were like the first like girl power. You know what I mean? Like I felt like that really kind of resonated with me, and I always knew that I could do whatever I wanted to do. Um, I mean, I was lucky my parents were amazing and always were like, whatever you want to do, we'll, you know, we'll support you. Um, but like, I wasn't scared to be in a movie. I wasn't scared to, you know, do whatever it was that I was doing because I knew that anything boys can do, girls can do that. Woo! <laughs> I learned how to get things done through a devious way. Because we had a masseuse on set, because we were we were pretty beat up, and and especially Sigourney, she's six feet tall, she's running around up and down ramps carrying a nine year old child, and she was getting back problems, and after they finally like like yeah and like way deep into the set into the schedule, they finally made her a, a fake girl to carry around that was later, but I knew she had back problems, and we all took advantage of the masseuse when we could, and I heard uh, a, an assistant say that they were going to let the masseuse go for budget reasons. So I sneaked up to Sigourney's assistant, and I dropped a dime. And lo and behold, we got the masseuse. Oh. <laughs> and if I had said anything about it myself. No, no. <laughs> okay, so life lesson. Don't give away uh, your thoughts. Well, it's the same film, like, Want to act with children or animals, right? <laughs> well, 
we have something to add to that. Don't act with guns. Because <laughs> <laughs> Fred and I, then you have been strapped to you with duct tape. And uh, Jim Cameron, almighty general, refused to let you, you know, dismantle the gun in order to, so you could run around like Bill yeah. Paxton, Bill Hope, and Rico Ross, and having a great time. But the one thing it did is it cemented a really good brush. Yeah, it did. And we also learned that that Vesuvius, who was there, and we were the ones who needed it most, never, ever got a Vesuvius. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned that sometimes those who need it the most don't, don't get it. Uh, I would say uh, one thing I learned about it, it is an alien thing, is, uh, you know, as I say, it was my first job, so I was freaking out. And the moment I stepped onto the set, Sigourney came up to me privately and said, Hi, I'm Sigourney Weaver, and I'm so happy to have you in our cast. And I thought from that moment, I really learned a lot from that, because I went, you know, well, I'm doing, if I'm in a bigger position, I'm going to do that every day I'm going to become, you know. And that was such a generous moment, and I also thought in my head, you should do that, and you did. So uh, it, it was very impressive, and it seemed genuine as well. So I think that probably helped the world of uh, the movie set a lot, that kind of attitude from her. Amazing. Thank you guys, everyone yeah. give it up.